As always, I'm thankful for this opportunity to stand before you and deliver a, a lesson from God's Word. I had not originally intended on throwing things at anybody out here, but now that I know that it's expected, I might start bringing a slingshot, start popping folks who might be wandering off to sleep. I might want to leave it up here just for everybody else who comes up and talks. If you would be turning over to the book of Genesis, chapter 6, we'll be reading the first five verses of that chapter. Moses there records for us, again, Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, beginning. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. Now, Maybe you've heard, maybe you've seen. This passage has captured the imagination of many throughout recent history, and no doubt beyond that. As a result, there have been countless books written on this subject matter due to, or in order to further the mystery that many claim would be found in these five verses. Now, the phrase we're talking about is the sons of God. It's a mysterious concept to many and is perpetuated by several things. But this morning, I would like for us to consider the two possible views as to the meaning of this phrase, sons of God. Now, either this phrase is a literal son of God or this phrase describes a figurative son of God, or sons of God as it might be. As students of the Bible, we are always interested in seeking out to find exactly what the scriptures teach on any given subject. Thus, we wish to take the Bible in its entirety to determine the meaning of this subject, just as we would any other subject. So we're going to allow the Bible, the whole body of Scripture to interpret the, the meaning of this phrase. So just who were these sons of God? Now our first option, some claim that the sons of God were men who were faithful to Jehovah God that married heathen women. They would make the claim that this term is applied in a figurative sense. Thus, these sons of God can be likened to a Christian male, Christian man, marrying a non-Christian woman. Now, as we progress throughout this study, this concept will be made much more clear. As some would say, we'll circle back to it. I would like to take a little bit more time in dealing with the opposing view of this. And that is that these sons of God were, in fact, supernatural beings, which were the offspring of fallen angels and human women. To get a better idea of that, one need not go any further than what many would call a demigod. <clears throat> you see, and in, in particularly with Greek mythology, you had these different gods of that pan pantheon coming to earth, having relationships with sometimes men, mainly women, and their offspring would grow up to do great things. You think of Hercules and Perseus and all these other children. In fact, there was a, a children's book series written on it, and some of them became movies, the Percy Jackson. Okay, that whole concept came from the Greek mythology, 
Now, certainly there were some liberties taken, but you had these children that had special abilities because they were part God and part human. Again, we typically refer to them as demigods. That's kind of the idea that many would claim the phrase, the sons of God, really are. Now, in order to support this claim, many would cite the use of the Hebrew term, Nephil, which is translated in our version, giants. The plural of that would be Nephilim. These Nephilim were children of fallen angels and women. That's what they would, that's what they would claim. They go on to cite Jude, chapter, or Jude verse 6 and verse 7 to explain these unholy unions. They claim then that these angels, these fallen angels, sought after human flesh, strange flesh, unauthorized flesh. They claim then that this phrase refers to uh, the women which, we, which these angels impregnated. That is the, the strange flesh. They further claim that other scriptures must be disregarded in order to interpret the Bible this way. In fact, they would say that Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 1 does not in fact refer to Israel. And they do not allow Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 to set the context for the following verses. As we said earlier, there's been many books written on this subject. I've referenced throughout this study for, uh, I guess, a crutch to describe some of these t concepts, a book by Ryan Peterson called The Judgment of the Nephilim. On page 39 of that book, he makes this statement. So, in all contexts, the term sons of God is clearly referring to angels. The notion of angels taking human wives poses a big hurdle for many. But we should never fear a literal reading of the Word of God, which is our foundation. Within this context, one ought to leave behind whatever presuppositions he may bring to the Bible and let the text and its corresponding passages speak for themselves. Angels from heaven married women and produced children with them. Again, that's page 39 of his book, Judgment of the Nephilim. Now, as you go throughout this book, you'll notice that one claim, one theme, if you will, is that God sent the global flood to remove these unholy children between the angels and human women. The flood was designed to destroy these offspring. Now, we would like to take up that challenge of allowing the Bible to speak for itself. Just what does the Bible, taken entirely, say about this phrase, this matter? First, I want to consider with you the, the context of Genesis chapter 6. We know in Genesis chapter 5, this chapter, Moses there records for us, the descendants of Adam all the way up until Noah and his sons, which then would bring us to Genesis chapter 6 verse 1. We see there that men multiplied on the earth, not angels. As a result, daughters were born. Of course, sons were too, but that wasn't the focus of this, this passage. But daughters were born. And naturally, they were attractive. And they were attractive to these sons of God. Though once faithful, their manners were corrupted. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 33, how evil communications corrupt good manners or good morals. We know in following the rest of this chapter that wickedness ran rampant throughout the entire world. Manners were corrupted. Wickedness, as we said, was rampant. Because of this wickedness, the amount of that wickedness God's wrath and God's judgment was demanded. Which then brings us to Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. Which reads, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. 
both man and beast and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You see, we know from Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, that the Christian can indeed fall from grace. This is possible for all who have obeyed God throughout time. We can thus conclude from this passage that the sons of God were men who were faithful to Jehovah God under the law of patriarchy. Now what about the passage in Jude that they so quickly run to? Jude verses 6 and 7. Actually, we'll read verse 5 as well. What is Jude trying to tell us? Well, verse 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the, day, the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. As we previously stated, advocates of this idea claim that the angels in verse 6 were guilty of seeking after strange flesh. And they use verse 7 to try to couple that idea, couple with that idea. They claim these fallen angels committed the same sin as found in Sodom and Gomorrah, verse 7 there. They even go so far as to say that Sodom and Gomorrah were names of angelic beings instead of cities. The text simply does not support this idea. It does not lend itself to any of these views. Clearly, these are three separate events recorded from history, and they were used as examples by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, to illustrate what will happen to those who would rebel against God. You might call to mind the sermon we heard last week about the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, and that is homosexuality. And then months before that, we had several sermons over these passages, dealing with these examples, referencing them. But verse 5 there shows that the rebellious Israelites were destroyed in the wilderness. God did, in, in fact, have his people saved from Egyptian bondage, but those who were unfaithful to him were punished for that activity. They were destroyed. Verse 6, these rebellious angels were sent to everlasting chains. And verse 7, these rebellious cities were engaging in homosexuality. Now, at least they are consistent, those who would support this claim. They also run to 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, in the same way they do Jude chapter 5, verse, or Jude verses 5 and 7. Again, they claim the angels listed in verse 4 are guilty of fornication with strange flesh. But they overlook the fact that the order is different from their narrative. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 9, draws conclusion from these examples that have been used by the Holy Spirit. Thus, he's giving a commentary as to why these examples were used to begin with and recorded it to begin with as well. Again, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the, the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. You see, if God's going to deal justly with Israel, you know, removing them from their Egyptian captors, but then punish them for disobedience, punish the ungodly cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because they rebelled against his moral law, why would he not do that for us? You see, if we rebel against God, the only thing we deserve is hellfire. The passages cited thus far do not support the claims of these angelic beings, one, coming to earth, and two, mating with human women.
To claim that these passages support this angelic takeover of earth through wedlock or even fornication is to make a gross folly. Next, we would point out that not only were these fallen angels, of course, they were, they were wrong anyway because they were punished, but these fallen angels are not only innocent of committing fornication with human women, but going a step beyond that, they were incapable of doing so. Fallen angels, if they came to earth, which you have a mountain of evidence to climb over to say that they did, are not compatible with humans. What do we mean by that? God pronounced an unbreakable law of reproduction. Everything produces after its own kind. Genesis chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, as well as verses 24 and 25. This law of nature has never been broken and never will be broken. If ever such a union occurred, that is, between an angelic being and a human woman, it would be likened to the bestiality found in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 23. It is confusion. <clears throat> the same result would follow. No offspring produced. We see this nowadays when we have animal husbandry. When we make certain hybrids, well, those hybrids are sterile. They cannot produce offspring. Now, angels, fallen or faithful, are incapable of reproduction. Jesus asserts that angels are sexless beings. Matthew chapter 22, verses 29 through 30. In dealing with a question regarding the, the resurrection, Jesus answers here, says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. You see, marriage is an accommodation for mortals, for humans, for life in the flesh. You can also find this account recorded in Mark chapter 12, verses 24 and 25, as well as Luke chapter 20, verses 34 through 36. Since these offspring, these sons of God, the offspring of that claim, anyway, were not angelic hybrids, what were they? You see, the term giants in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, is taken from the Hebrew word nephil, or nephilim in its plural form. We've referenced this earlier. Now, Strong, Strong's defines that term as follows. A feller, that is, a bully or a tyrant, a giant. These giants became mighty men, which defined as powerful, the warriors, tyrants, champions. You could easily say that these are big fellers, and they're mean. They became men of renown, men in authority. You see, they were wicked men in leadership roles. Now, no doubt, they could have been large in stature, and I'm certain they were. But that was through process of genetic recombination of human DNA through the normal way how people get here. This wickedness brought about by these men brought nothing short of God's judgment and God's wrath found in Genesis chapter 5 verses or Genesis chapter 6 verses 5 through 7 as we read earlier. Now supporters of this idea claim the flood was used to destroy these angelic beings these angelic hybrids. We referenced that earlier. Yet, they fail to realize that the concept of giants are mentioned after the flood also. You see in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 11, chapter 3, verse 11, chapter 9, verse 2, as well as Numbers chapter 13, verse 33, and Numbers 14, verse 38. And the giant that we're all more, more familiar with would be Goliath. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 4. Now, giants were genetically possible through human procreation. I have a co-worker that is 
mentioned to me a couple times how he and I think it was his friend rather went to Thailand on a mission journey and evidently he's a he's a short guy and he gets to Thailand and he's taller than they are so he's looked upon as a giant there well I'm six foot four inches and my co-worker is not quite there and his friend is shorter than he is. So what would you think I'd be considered there? Nephilim? More than likely. You see, King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter twenty or chapter ten, verse twenty three, he's described as being shoulders and higher above the people. He was head and shoulders above the rest of Israel. He was physically taller, it's thus easily recognizable when standing with the people. Now there's an issue with this fact that giants existed after the flood. As we said, either giants are genetically possible through normal human procreation or God failed in destroying them when he sent the flood. Who would dare make that accusation against Almighty God? Those are your two options. Now, a lot of all the evidence, contrary to the concept that these sons of God produced angelic hybrids, that angels came to earth in their fallen state to reproduce with pretty or even ugly women, for that matter, says they were fair. You know, if they're an angel, how would they really know the difference? But either way, there it's the assertion is that these angels came to earth and made children with these women now I'd like to think that we've set forth enough evidence to disprove that concept but it's not enough to say no that's wrong it must also contain this is right instead so just who were these sons of God there is but one way to scripturally apply this phrase you see the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 were those men who were faithful to Jehovah God under the law which they were given, that is, patriarchy. We see in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, that the sons of God were the nation of Israel. Today, there are those that are qualified to be the sons of God. Now, this is done by the very will of God, and we're going to develop this point as we progress. John chapter 1, verses 6 through 13. John chapter 1, verses 6 through 13 reads, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. To be qualified to be called the Son of God, we must first be led by the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. And Romans chapter 8, verses 4, 14 through 17. The Holy Spirit there records by the human hand of Paul, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. One is led by the Spirit by walking in faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. To walk by faith is to walk by the word of God, 
Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So thus, if we are to be sons of God, we must be obedient to His will. There is no other way to become a son of God. Now, once one finds this word of God, we have responsibilities. If we are indeed worried about salvation, we as humans must understand that there is a path to salvation, a path to becoming a son of God. Not in the sense of being Jesus, he is the only begotten of God, but in the adoptive sense that we just referenced from Romans chapter 8. In order to receive this adoption, one must hear God's word, as we just said. They must also believe in Christ, John 8, 24. They must repent of their past sins, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. They must publicly confess Christ before others. Not just they believe in him, but also recognize and can, can show that he is indeed the very Son of God. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. And finally, that candidate must be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. As we said earlier, this concept of the sons of God has fascinated quite a many people. After all, it is indeed a fascinating subject that angelic beings coming to earth and having offspring with humans. I suspect, as we referenced earlier, that the various mythologies and the pantheons of pagan peoples has had a strong influence on those who would say that they believe the Bible. Thus, it would be easier to entertain such ideas when we become saturated with worldliness, plain ignorance of the scriptures. Now, we know from reading Greek mythology that this was a normal occurrence between having, having these false gods coming to earth and having children with these women. Though it is a fascinating idea to entertain, it is a false idea. It is a lie. And as we read this morning for the scripture reading in, in Thessalonians there, if you don't believe the truth, the only other option is a lie. And that's where you stand on this. If you believe the lie of the sons of God, we're angelic beings. There are implications to that, as I'd like to think we covered this morning. The truth of God's word has spoken. Jehovah God did no such thing with his creation. I would like again to quote Ryan Peterson this morning from his book, Judgment of the Nephilim. So in all contexts, the term sons of God is clearly referring to angels. The notion of angels taking human wives poses a big hurdle for many, but we should never fear a literal reading of the Word of God, which is our foundation. Within this context, one ought to leave behind whatever presuppositions he may bring to the Bible and let the text and its corresponding passages speak for themselves. Angels from heaven married women and produced children with them. Well, this morning, we have allowed the Bible to speak for itself, not only in defeating this false doctrine, this false concept of how fallen angels came to earth and, and procreated with human women, but we have learned what it means to become a son of, or to be a son of God and how to become one. I only hope that this Ryan Peterson can actually follow up with his own words and let the Bible speak for itself to examine all of the Bible and what it says about any given subject. Now, he is right in, the, in that statement of the Bible being our foundation. You have to have a good foundation first. You have to understand that the Word of God is meant to provide that foundation. But if you don't let it speak for itself, you will not get where you're wanting to go ultimately. And that should be heaven. Now we're told in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, Paul there says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, 
but as under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You know, heirs inherit things. In this life, usually when a loved one passes, they might leave some form of material wealth. As an heir, I would take ownership of those things if I had any wealthy relatives. God has promised his faithful children that they will inherit everlasting life. Matthew chapter 19, verse 29. Now, if this is appealing to you, why not take the steps this morning to become a son of God? Receive the adoption of sons through obedience to the will of God. Now, if you already have become one, that is a Christian, see those terms are synonyms, a Christian and son of God. If you've already become a Christian, yet through process of time have allowed sin back into your life, and you've lost your inheritance, remove that sin through repentance and prayer. James chapter 5, verse 16, and 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 9. Whatever your need may be this morning, please make it known as together we stand to sing.